Hello, my name is Deepak Kalra from the European Institute for Innovation through Health Data. I'm speaking today on behalf of myself and my colleague Bledon Rees, who's chair of the Digital Health Society. Our two not-for-profit organisations have worked together with multiple stakeholders across Europe to develop a proposal for strengthening public trust in the reuse of health data for research that I'd like to tell you about today. But let me start by telling you about where many health systems find themselves today. From an economic perspective, most health systems in the world are stretched financially. There are legacy issues to do with the public health spending that's taken place in recent years, in particular following COVID. And yet at the same time, there are concerns about the need to invest more in health services. The burden from society is increasing as we all gradually get older and older and develop more chronic diseases and have multiple diseases that need to be treated in parallel. It's also important and of growing societal concern that our public health system must be equitable and respond to all sectors of society addressing their public health needs. So we have a challenge to transform healthcare. One of the advantages that we have today is the growing quantity of health information that is collected digitally. And you can see on this slide several examples of where health data will be accumulated in electronic form, in computable form, but also importantly, places where we need to learn and reuse that learning back into the delivery of better healthcare. We need to use health data much more right across the spectrum from care to research. Near to the patient, we must monitor their patient care trajectories much more formally through electronic tools, use that information to join the dots between clinicians along care pathways and offer better continuity of care. Also join the dots with patients through telehealth and personal health systems deliver more personalised care and refocus health systems more strongly on prevention. At the population level, at the level of a country or a region, we need to use health data to better plan the way health services should be organised to improve quality and safety monitoring, including pharmacovigilance, and which of you needs to be reminded how much we've critically depended through COVID on public health surveillance and public health information to develop good, successful strategies. But we now need to really accelerate research to improve our understanding of diseases and personalized medicine, for accelerated development of drugs and vaccines and for digital innovations, including apps, sensors, wearables, and of course, AI. As we shift from left to right, there is a challenge with public acceptance of the uses of data. They understand less and less about why and how their data are being used. The organisations that use their data are increasingly unfamiliar as you move towards the right. They're not classical healthcare delivery organisations. They are innovators in research, digital, innovators that they're not familiar with or don't expect to be using health data. It takes a long time for research results to feed back into changes in patient care and patient experience. And sometimes the patients whose data are used are not the ones who will benefit from the learning gained from the data, which overall leads to a feeling of less choice and greater risk, which makes it harder for the public to trust. We often assume that the concern that patients have is about their identity. And of course, most countries around the world have increasingly robust data protection legislation that research innovators have to conform to. But studies confirm to us all that public are not only concerned about their identity, they want to know that their data are being used for societally acceptable and beneficial purposes, not for profiteering and not for commercial advantage exclusively. 
how do we go forward from here? The public and decision makers need a way of determining who to trust with health data and why. Bona fide organisations who have an honest, legitimate reason for wanting to conduct research on data need to demonstrate that they are trustworthy and everybody needs greater transparency in how health data are being used. We have therefore developed a proposal for a societal compact, a kind of social contract for the secondary use of health data that I'd like to tell you about. A societal compact or social contract is a voluntary agreement that's made between a range of different stakeholders who are cooperating in order to achieve societal benefits by giving access to and reusing health data. Its aim is to provide assurance to stakeholders, especially to the public, that the individuals who are using health data are doing so in legal, ethical and secure ways and are focusing on society's interests. This proposal was developed late last year, building on over 15 years of work that many of us have been involved in, developing principles, codes of practice and other rules about how health data should be shared and used. And it was developed as part of a programme of health topics that myself and Bledin have co-led between our institutes since 2020 when we first published a Calls to Action report. The link to that is in the bottom of this slide, which you could look at later on. The proposal for the compact has been taken forward this year with further consultations, and we've recently published this version. We would love UN member country feedback especially on its global suitability and also any expressions of interest from countries who would like to work with us to develop it further. The compact has several chapters and I'm going to speak to you today mostly about the first three of these four bullets, the ethical principles, the purposes and the commitments. Let's start with the ethical principles. Every organisation that agrees to sign the societal compact and make public its commitment to it has to promise that it will only use and reuse health and health related data for purposes that either directly result or contribute to bringing benefits to society for improved opportunities for better health and care that they will never reuse data for purposes that are unethical, violate human rights, will disadvantage any individuals or groups, or will only be for the purposes of their own organisational interest. And that when they use data, they will always safeguard the privacy of the individuals whose data are included in the data they've got. They'll, they'll abide by data protection laws, adopt strong security measures and anonymize the data whenever they don't need identifiable information. Data users must be respectful of the organizations from whom they have obtained the data and the purposes those organisations would have approved. The results of using data must be published or shared in some other way unless there is a risk of identifying individuals or introducing discrimination. If the results can't be openly published because they're going to be incorporated as commercial products or services such as new drugs or new vaccines, then these must be available to all possible adopters, which means all possible countries on fair terms, such as fair pricing. <clears throat> Organisations must make every effort to be as transparent to the public as possible about how they are using data, and the decision-making bodies that grant access to data must also be transparent to the public about the uses that they have permitted and what has happened as a result. As I mentioned earlier, the public are concerned not only with the protection of their identity, but that their data are used appropriately. This list, which we've included in the proposal for a societal compact, has come from the draft 
regulation of the European Commission for the European Health Data Space, and it lists several purposes that are permitted. Public interest for public and occupational health, uses by public sector bodies, statistics relating to health and care, education and teaching, scientific research, innovations, training and testing algorithms, and providing personalised healthcare. In the document, we've gone further on research and put in a lot of illustrative purposes of research to help convey what kinds of research may be acceptable. It's also very important to make clear to the public what kinds of use will be absolutely prohibited will never happen. Anything that might be detrimental to an individual, uh, that might influence decisions about them in a negative way, anything that takes decisions that might exclude them from the benefit of something like insurance or modify their insurance premiums, direct advertising and marketing to health professionals, providing data to third parties that you haven't got permission for when you requested access to data, or developing any products and services that might harm individuals, such as illicit drugs and tobacco. But we've also added to that an important rider that there must be never any use of data that would violate the European Convention on Human Rights. And we have added further prohibited purposes that go beyond the European Commission list, things like research that would have failed to gain ethical approval, the development of any use, new technologies that would not be permitted for use in the EU, weapons development, drugs for capital punishment, eugenics, politically motivated projects, discriminations, or research that would be of only financial benefit but no societal benefit, or research that would be considered illegal in the country where the data originate or where it's being used. So organisations that agree that they will always uphold the ethical principles I've described and that the purposes for which they want to use the data fall within the permitted purposes and absolutely not in the prohibited purposes, then have to further promise that they will use the data that they are granted access to in appropriately secure and transparent ways. That means that they will make sure they have all the legal permissions they need, that they will apply data protection regulation rules, and they will handle the data securely, that the results will be made available in the ways that they've already declared, that they will be transparent about the uses of data and the societal benefit coming from the work that they've done on the data. So how might this compact be put into practice? The document goes into a lot of detail about an operational and governance workflow, which I'm not going to go through today, but invite you to read in the document. We are keen that trust is strengthened all over the world and that health data from every country can contribute to research so that we reduce the risk of country bias and make sure that the results from research are globally suitable. That's why we would like it if ministries in UN countries would be willing to review this proposal and to give us feedback on its possible usefulness in your country and how practical it would be to adopt it in your country. And if any of your countries would like to be early adopters of it, to put it into practice, Bledin and I will be happy to support with our colleagues those countries and help you to learn the best lessons about how to make it a success. We would also like the Scientific Committee of the UN to allocate agenda time next year to discuss feedback from countries on this compact, including early adopter experience, and to discuss in more detail how this compact or an improved version of it could be adopted and promoted by the UN. I'd like to close by giving you on this slide the download link where you can obtain a copy of this document. Mentioned to you uh, 
for interest that there's recently been a news article from France about this compact explaining how it might be relevant to France and I've got here our email addresses. We'd be very happy to hear from you. Thank you very much for listening.